Hi, and welcome to the Tattooed Teacher Podcast, where we get to know the person behind the professional, going below the surface of what we see. Join with me as I talk with some incredible individuals from around Australia and the globe. My guest today is the eternal optimist, Adriano De Prado. I hope you enjoy this fun conversation with Adriano as much as I did. Well, good evening. Good afternoon, good morning, whatever, what time of day it happens to be when you're listening to the Tattoo Teacher Podcast. Thank you for listening today. And our guest is the amazing Adrian De Prato. Now, Adrian is a designer, a teacher, educator, and now in a new role, which I'll let him tell you about. But most importantly, he's an eternal optimist. So Adrian, Adriano, sorry, welcome to the podcast. Well, it's great to be with you, Phil, and, and uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Ah, it's my pleasure. It's taken a while to get to this, but uh, I'm glad we're here. We still there? I am still here. Yeah, sorry that that it, so it did cut out. So you cut out. Um, We'll, we'll, we'll keep persevering. So go. I, I missed what. That's, absolutely. No, welcome to the podcast. I appreciate your time. Yeah, I'm really excited to be here, mate, and um, I'm looking forward to the conversation. But first and foremost, I ask all my guests this: What is your why? You've been in design education for a long time now. So, what has kept you there? Yeah, I suppose that's a really interesting question. Um, and the best way I probably could answer it is this. I started out my professional life in the world of advertising and my intention was going to be, you know, in, in, a, in a place, uh, in that kind of commercial place. Uh, I, um, some of your listeners who have probably heard parts of my story before, even through, through my own podcast, um, would know that I then um, completed a a teaching qualification while I did my design degree and um, I got a phone call from a school that who invited me to do a maternity leave replacement for 12 months you know I was all of 22 years old and had no idea what teachers even earned at that time and uh, here I was this brash um, uh, young man in the world of advertising thinking you know life's very good and um, everything's ahead of me but I, but I made a commitment to this school that I'd take on this job. And um, the way I look at it is that education chose me because I stayed in it. You know, I stayed in it. And that was back in 19, 1994 or 1995, something like that. And um, then I stayed in education. There were times throughout that journey, though, I've got to admit, Phil, that I um, definitely thought, well, this is no way known what education should be. Like, there's got to be alternatives. But the one thing I suppose that that I kept persevering is in was that being a, a visual arts teacher, um, art and design, um, you know, no two answers from a student are the same. And, exactly. And and that always kept encouraging me that there's got to be a better way. That yes, that's my experience, which is really exciting and dynamic. But I don't necessarily believe that was the experience of. Uh, my colleagues in other faculties, which probably, you know, this, whether it was them or, or the system itself continued to have this very binary perspective of the way in which learning should be delivered and what assessment should look like and, you know, the, the rote nature of things and the standardised nature of things, which um, was a real affront to me. But, you know, every every organiser, every school that I was actually in and learning community, I was going to call it organisation, but a learning community, I just... <laughs> I just um, Every time I saw that where there was what I sensed was a challenge or a problem, I just simply put my hand up and said, I'm, I want to be part of a solution. I was never I was never anyone that wanted to sit back and, and be one of those that, you know, threw the darts and, and whinged about their context um, or the circumstance. So where, where I thought there was opportunity. So I just kept pursuing those. And then, you know, it steamrolled into opportunities to be you know, a deputy head at two, two independent Catholic schools here in, in Melbourne. Um, and then after a while, Phil, I, I made the decision that um, I was exhausted. 
you know, it was 1919, 2019, sorry, not 1919, 2019. And I was exhausted. Dad passed away that year. Mum was really ill. Um, and I was, you know, her carer. And I made a decision that um, I can't sustain this. You know, I was doing 80 hour weeks uh, as a deputy head at, at this school. Wonderful, wonderful wow. school. Had gr- I've got great fond memories of that that experience there. But it was time, you know, it was time. And I then started a private business, started a podcast, wrote a book. And then I got a phone call from an executive search company towards the end of 2022 saying there's this opportunity in higher education. Um, and you wouldn't believe it, Adriana, it's a art and design institute. And I just thought, you know, I still had that burning desire inside of me about education, but I, but I felt that this could be an environment where it was a lot more agile and a lot more flexible. Okay. Um, and although highly regulated as, as a higher education institute should be, um, considering we are providing people with a certificate that's going to get them employed, um, uh, I just felt that, wow, this, this could be really something something new. And hence where I've now landed as the campus director at LCI in Melbourne, which is you know a, an institute that primarily focuses on art design and entrepreneurship education. So all the spaces that allow me to flex design thinking, um, you know, allows me to flex the balance between explicit teaching and project-based learning, um, allows me to focus on the inherent potential of each learner. And in my context, it could be a, an 18 year old or it could be a 50 year old now. Right. Um, and, um, and just seeing individuals, discover their possibility as emerging artists, designers, or entrepreneurs, that is a significant part of my why. This is a long answer to your question, by the way. Um, no, I love it. I love it. And so I think, I think at the crux of what I'm sharing with you is education and the opportunities that it, it has afforded me help me catch fire in the space of servant leadership. I think that's the key here. And I think that's central to my why. My my why is about helping um, people get to the point of their own self-actualization where where they unlock their human dimension potential. Um, And that's the thing that keeps drawing me back. Those magic moments, I'm sure you've had them in the classroom too, you know, those aha moments when you know that student has had made that breakthrough and realised, I actually belong here, like I actually can do this. And when that happens, the learning that follows is transformational because they'll take risks, they feel safe in that environment, they'll push the boundaries um, and they'll keep challenging themselves to be better than they were yesterday. And um for anyone listening to this who's not an educator, that's the magic part of, of what we do um, on a regular basis. And seeing that happen um, is pretty phenomenal. Yeah. It, uh, you've touched on so many things. I mean, you've designed design thinking, art and visualisation, entrepreneurship, the aha moment, a safe learning environment. I mean, we could almost press stop now and... And that'd be good. <laughs> sure. <laughs> but it's it's one of those things you're right. It it keeps us educators coming back when we see the light in the eyes. And then it's just like it's like it's like when you play around the golf. I'm a terrible golfer. But I you hit one ball perfectly every game. Yeah, right. And you, you always go back because you go, I can do that again. <laughs> it's quite seductive in many ways. I mean, we've got lots of challenges, I suppose, um, on one level in, in education in, in Australia and across the globe as, as we navigate, you know, the complexity of a changing world. Um, and we are, we are in, the, in the midst of a, of a skills revolution. We are in the midst of a world that uh, uh, is in the grips of, you know, geopolitical shifts the climate emergency, we've got biosecurity on a regular basis, we've got resource scarcity increasing as a result of that, we've got um, the challenges of the identity politics that are going on throughout the world, you know, the cultural wars that go on, um, kind of unnecessarily, of course, but uh, it's our reality, right? And so we're navigating that that space 
at the same time, we're trying to, um, in many ways, revolutionise K to twelve education as well as um, tertiary, uh, and and it's 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 a very complex space, and I think today. The expectations on teachers, the people that do what you do, the, the chalky at the front of the room, um, at the coalface, the complexity of what you're called to be today is um, is challenging, but it's also filled with enormous opportunities, I reckon. You know, and 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 and, and those opportunities are ways in which to continue to shape what education can be to prepare the students within our care for their tomorrow because it's not ours, it's theirs really, isn't it? I mean, the people in your classroom are going to be the future captains of industry, let's face it, and, and the future Definitely. contributors um, and, and and the people who are probably going to be running the uh, retirement homes that we'll end up in. <laughs> That's a scary thought for some. Um, we, better be, we better be nice. <laughs> we better be nice. But, you know, like we're, we're, we're in, a, in a place right now where, um, you know, the urgency for, for change is real. Um, and and I feel for educators because uh, uh, it's 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 a it's a complex time I reckon to be a to be an educator with shortages going on, um, no real significant change to working conditions because we we just keep rolling out the same binary agreements, um, you know, and, and and no one's being really creative about how we can effectively use time instead of it being time poor to time rich. Yeah, there's so many things that could be changed and just little tweaks here and there, and I think would make a huge difference. However, as you know, working in an institution, change is very slow. Yeah, look, look, I think um, that's an interesting statement. I, I don't disagree with that in, um, in the reality of most learning contexts. But I'll say this, Phil, I've had the great pleasure of, of interviewing lots of people <laughs> over the last few years. And I describe them as game changers intentionally because they're individuals within their industry and many of them are within education and many of them are principals. They're not waiting for permission anymore. No. And so, so uh, yes, change is complex. It is difficult. But I reckon if we keep saying that to ourselves, then we've convinced ourselves that it's so hard that we're going to not even attempt to, you know, uh, broach that subject. The difference that I've encountered with individuals who have said, yeah, it's complex and it's difficult because the first thing that people ask themselves when change is, is afoot is how does it affect me? And then the second thing is, am I still relevant, you know, when change is occurring? These these people that I've had the great pleasure of encountering over the years and seeing their practice unfold um, have the courage to go, okay, I've, a, I've got a responsibility to today and managing today, but I am not going to allow the noise to prevent me to think about what could be tomorrow. And, and, they, and they've created cultures um, and, and a practice that allows them to continue to move on a continuum, not revolution so much, maybe more evolution, which I think yep. is, is a probably more palatable way to navigate change um, for many. Um, and, and so I, I feel I feel that there, there are people who are willing. And to be fair, Phil, there are people who are not willing, who, who actually, yep. I think, lack the courage, and that might be a provocative statement to make, but... I believe they genuinely lack the courage to to want it to, to be different. Yeah, I think they have the, the fear of the unknown. So they're like, I'm comfortable here. What if this goes wrong? And as you and I know, with design, we want to know what can go wrong. Yeah. And, and we explore that and we actually... Um, thrive in it sometimes yeah absolutely this is this is the magic thing about um design technology that's your that's your space um you know or whether it's graphic design or in, interior design and some which is more, more my wheel kind wheelhouse now um we, you and i are still bound by learning outcomes we're still bound by i think i think you got i think in secondary education you're calling it achievement standards right it's the same same 
same vernacular. It's all the same. It's all the yeah. same, right? Um, we're bound by that. We, we, we have an obligation in education to not only uh, help students acquire the knowledge, the skills, but to apply it. And in our context, in our learning area, we apply every bit of knowledge, every bit of skill that's being taught straight away. So th they are actually um, navigating the complexity and the challenge of, of the, 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 knowledge, the theory of the knowledge and the skill all in the one hit because they're applying it in the context. We will start with helping them develop their mastery of that, right? We'll, we'll help them start developing what joinery looks like, you know, um, how to sand something, how to stain, stain, stain something. How to how to um, uh, make the robotics work, you know? Or, or in my context, it could be orthogonal drawing or isometric drawing or, or floor plans or elevations, you know, and so on. Or in graphic design, it might be the technical elements of how to navigate Adobe Creative Suite. So there's a skill component that we are we are navigating through that's a non-negotiable. We understand that because that's the knowledge of that discipline. Then there is the knowledge of the discipline from a conceptual point of view. But the beauty is. We allow them, we, we create exercises where they can trial all of that. And then we create an exercise that allows them to showcase their creativity and their imagination and further apply those skills and that knowledge they've learned, where they develop the most fascinating folios. You know, yeah. and every time I see that, I just think I'm always engaged in what they're their learning journeys or their thinking process. That's the stuff that I go, wow, well, that's, that's, you know, that's a fresh approach, you know, to, to say, let's say um, um, uh, it could be a, 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 a thing for someone who's vision impaired. One of the, one of the, 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 the walking canes I've seen students design things that, are, that have robotics as part of that. that can, can sense the ground underneath it. And I just think how brilliant is that here is this person's got a social conscience, wants to help someone who's got an impediment creating a device that they've used all the time, but let's make that device even more accessible for someone with that impediment. And I just think how remarkable is that, that there, there is this young person who is so conscious about the other and wants to do yep. something about it and they use design. And, and the first step, of course, is the empathy piece in, in that design thinking pr um, protocol um, to, to enter into that space. And I think imagine, imagine a world where... Businesses, governments started every um, road towards a solution through an empathy piece. Imagine, imagine a world, imagine a world where 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 there was this deep tuning in and listening about what's the need, really what's the need, you know, understanding the pain points, understanding the gain points, and working through, and then getting to a point of defining it and the return brief and then getting to an iteration stage and being okay in that iteration stage to try lots of things yeah, you know, and then get the feedback and then create the prototype, test it again and then, and then, and then eventually test it, you know, with, with, with a, with an audience um, and make those lesser refinements before they, before they jump into it. Imagine if they took the time to be that conscious around, you know, human-centered design, the way in which we tackle sustainability with our planet, the way in which we, you know, uh, uh, continue to look at the housing crisis in Australia or, or the way in which we look at really solving problems um, um, alongside of and in support of our First Nations people, um, you know, it would be really fascinating if we actually took the time to do that, because as you and I both know, the beauty, the power of design thinking is it's inherently human centered. Yeah, immediately, because your first step is empathy. It's like, how do I, how do I feel, or how do I put myself in their shoes just for a minute, or their perspective, and try and bring that into what I've, I've felt, experienced, and want to actually do. You know, one of the things that I keep saying um, to uh, the students at uh, LCI in Melbourne, who are who are aspiring artists and designers, and and our institute specialises in um, uh, fashion, costume design, interactive design, which is kind of UX UI, you know, game gamification. We we specialise in graphic and digital design, filmmaking, photography, visual arts, interior design, 
And then we also now uh, have branched out since I've commenced uh, in the area of, of business. So, the, so we, we're looking at now the, um, the entrepreneurial space, but through through the lens of creative industry. So it's, the, it's creativity and commerce working beautifully, you know, in, in this space. There's so many parents probably listening to this and going, oh, my, my son or daughter will never have a career in that. There's no jobs in art and design, but I, I'll, I'll dispel that really fast, right? Um, it's one of the fastest growing fields of, uh, of, of career in, in Australia. So it's grown 27% in the last 10 years. There, there aren't many that have grown that fast. Um, but the, the point I want to make here is when I talk to these students, their greatest gift as, a, as an emerging artist, designer, entrepreneur is, is their capacity to communicate. And what I mean by that is communication has a listening component to it. Communication has a, a synthesizing component to it. And, and, and it's also about listening not to respond, but just simply to understand. That's that empathy piece. And, and communication then has a capacity to to allow these emerging artists, designers and entrepreneurs to tell a story. There's a narrative behind the communication, whether it's in a visual form, whether it's in a written form, you know, whether it's in a spoken form. You know, that's their real gift. And that's, that can only happen, as you've said, if there's a deep tuning in about the other and the needs. Whether it's a human-centred design or whether it's a planet-centred design, it's about really listening and tuning in about what that is and gathering the necessary data. I, I, what's quite remarkable is I see students, like I said, between the age of 18 all the way through to 50, 60, who actually have a deep consciousness about people. They have a deep consciousness about the environment. They have a deep consciousness about, um, and, and like an ethical compass, you know, about um, what you and I would probably call a right and wrong, you know, and, and the vast majority are decent individuals that actually genuinely want to make a difference if they see an injustice um, and, and yeah. be proactive in that space. And artists and designers throughout all of our history have been agitators for social change, right? They've been agitators for, for human endeavour. And I'll, I'll throw in engineering in that and I'll throw in the advancements in science because there's so much creativity that's inherent in, in those spaces, right? Um, and, you know, good science. Yeah, well, if you look at um, society over, over the years, Societies flourish most when the arts have been flourishing, whether it's uh, Michelangelo and his painting, um, you know, Einstein and his science, in, in that creative sense. Whenever things are, are working together, society grows. And I've found over the years the most uh, empathetic students that I've had are often the most creative. And they see the injustices, and they they feel with such passion. It's it it's almost at their detriment because they 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 get so caught up in their their feelings and trying to resolve it. Yeah, I I I think um you're onto something really important here. I, I wonder what this type of pedagogical approach could look like if, if all learning areas had the courage to be open to its possibility. Nothing, nothing, nothing would be lost in relation oh. to building people's capacity to be literate and numerate. We understand the fundamental nature of those things, and they're not exclusive to English or mathematics, those two things, right? Being literate and numerate is relevant in every um, walk of life and every discipline. I mean, in design technology, uh, ha having an understanding of dimensioning and scale and radius, you know, all these things are really crucial, right? Um, but um, I just wonder if what, what learning could look like if we had this layer over the top around this design thinking protocol and, or, or um, a methodology that, that allows us to not only then measure a student's capacity to demonstrate an achievement standard or a learning outcome, but also measure character, also measure wellness. But I want to come back to that character piece to measure something that is ultimately about a particular disposition. 
And, and I know now that being in higher education, we have a responsibility not only to the knowledge of the discipline. Of course, no one wants to hire an interior designer that doesn't know how to do a floor plan or an elevation. I mean, what's, you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't want them working with your builder and you've got, you know, you've got uh, three inches in your doorway that, that shouldn't have been there and, and the wind and it's blowing a gale through it, right? So we want people to have the knowledge of that discipline. But at the same time, we want them to acquire these graduate attributes that allow them to be effective um, and, and full functioning humans, you know, in society and in their profession, you know, where, where they're independent and they can, they can collaborate, where, where they're ethical, where they understand ethics and social responsibility, where they, where they are open to the possibility of, you know, digital technologies, where there is communication and teamwork, where there is problem solving capacity and being agile and adaptive and all those kind of character attributes or, 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 um, you know, um, dispositions uh, that that ultimately are the things that get you employed. Yeah, you know? yeah. It's often the intangible that have the most valuable. Yeah. I mean, I hate the terminology soft skills because to actually have what they call them are some of the hardest things to learn and to grasp and to understand. Um, so it's skills can be taught. Uh, practical skills can be taught. They can be enhanced. But character is is there. It's hard to change that once you get to an adult level. Yeah, absolutely. And and I feel I feel like um, one of the things that I used to talk about with the school for tomorrow, which was the which is the business I started with Dr. Phil Cummins. Um, you know, we we said character, competency, and wellness. They were the three fundamental buckets of the reason why we do school. And um and the comp the competency piece. Most people understood, you know, and and that was a comfortable wheel wheelhouse for most educators. But I guarantee that character is not on the agenda, and and he's not given explicit time within a timetable in a K to twelve context in any meaningful way. I'm not suggesting it doesn't happen, but it's not necessarily explicitly looked at or done with the same level of commitment as it would be for the learning areas. And the same with wellness. Wellness is often, you know, your 15 minutes of the morning, which is really a roll call, right? Or there might be a dedicated well-being period throughout the week. Oh, we've done our well-being, off we go. But, you know, like in, in a world that's having greater knowledge about neurodivergence, greater knowledge about neurotypical thinking, greater knowledge around um, people becoming more and more comfortable with um, sharing issues of mental health um, and, and how we balance all of that. You know, uh, we've got technology that's so prevailing in our lives for good and for our elements that are really destructive. We see it, right? We see it everywhere. But but we get, we, we, we bring in an expert, we, we parachute them into our schools, we'll let them run a workshop for an hour and we think it's done, you know? Yeah. And, and I just think, isn't it fascinating that as, as an education system, one of the best in the world, by the way, I still think Australia still offers a phenomenal product uh, and and, and um, education system, but but why why is it that we continue to to focus more on the amount of time they sit on a seat throughout a day? We're one of the we, we're one of the most um, in terms of um, the OECD average of the amount of time per hours that we sit throughout a calendar year. We've smashed that average. We're one of the highest n uh, amount of hours. That we have, but nothing has changed in terms of the the measures, right? In twenty years, in fact, it's regressed. So, so we've got a new generation. We've got a, a society that's evolving at a rapid pace that that we probably hadn't seen to the scale that we've seen right now. We're, we're connected on a on a global scale on a level that we we probably hadn't seen prior to the advent of say something like the Internet of Things. Or, or social media, or now the advent of artificial intelligence in, in a more pronounced way, although that's been around for a while, but it's, you know, once language models come into it, it's a real game changer, right? And so, Absolutely. So I just think, I think, why is it that we keep going, this is the way schooling has to be, this is what it has to look like from, from you know, this time to this time? And, and, and let's, oh, you know, they need more hours. They need more hours. Let's let's give them more of that, and let's let's test them more frequently. You know, um, we, we're 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 just we, we continue to roll out 
uh, this antiquated way of delivering learning. Yet, yet the, the the students that are coming through, the generation that's coming through, is completely different. You know, I, yeah, I, I don't, wanna, I don't, I don't need know. it. Go on, sorry. So, yeah, they don't need that. You know, sage on the stage. No, they want information, like what I do. If I if I want to learn something new very quickly, YouTube. It's there. I can watch it. Fifteen minutes. You know, I, I think I think there's still for me because I'm biased about teachers. Of course, I feel that teachers still have a significant role to play uh, in the life of uh, and the formation of of uh, children and young people. Then ultimately, say at a university level. But you know, in our context, um, we don't even call them professors. They are academic mentors. In fact, we just refer to them as mentors. They are delivering knowledge. Uh, delivering skills, sometimes in a didactic way, sometimes in a more dynamic way. But we we structure our learning through design laboratory philosophy. You know, these are large, long-hour classes over six hours, but they're broken up into many activities and workshops. Um, We have specialists that come in. Every one of our mentors is not only uh, an outstanding academic, but they are also a professional that works in industry. Um, I think that's critical. You know, so so they are always in touch with uh, uh, you know the the, the latest um, um, movements within within their sector. So it can it can be current. Um, I've got mentors who who just like the students review their their units at the end of every twelve weeks to really scrutinise it and go, okay, well um, that that's working, but it, or, or it's no longer working, or we need to refine that. And so on, and so we're at, we're at a place where <clears throat> um, their understanding their role as a mentor that goes beyond the distilling of just knowledge or skill. They understand that they have a responsibility to the full student experience, and and you know what does that look like from uh, a well being construct? What does that look like from a character construct? What does it look like from how I'm preparing? Uh, and supporting st- students um, to unlock their potential and develop the employability skills they need to thrive in their future. What does that look like from a knowledge point of view? What does it look like from a skills point of view? Like, you know, that's why the role of any educator is so complex. But as a mentor, it changes the conversation a little bit because they realise that their role is not simply to be that sage. Yes, they have to have expertise. Yes, they should. They 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 can instill confidence in people by delivering that currency, but in the absence of focusing on the full student experience, it becomes a very hollow encounter for that student, right? And 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 if it's going to be this kind of very rote and robotic way of delivering it, well, just as you said, I probably could just watch a YouTube clip that might get me the same same lesson. Yeah, and I think I think it's key for an educator in any setting is the their experience on how to put knowledge into practice and by sitting with the student and you know we talked about the the rote learning and testing and more outcomes and this and you know as teachers as you know we're called for standardized testing but individual education plans so there's just this huge contradiction, but yet they're putting more weight on we've got to get the standard of testing right. Whereas, you know, if the kid doesn't have breakfast or has a fight with mum or dad or something goes wrong in that morning, that test is gone anyway. So it has no no relevance. And it's interesting because, I, cause I, you know, Phil, I'm, I'm actually a, a firm believer in the relevance of standards because I think standards create habits, create habits, create culture. Standards is completely different to standardization. Yes. Right? Because, you know, um, <clears throat> I might have a particular series of standards in a higher education institute around uh, academic integrity, right? You know, there's, the, the, there's some non negotiable pieces around um, plagiarism or contact cheating, you know? Um, or appropriation of other people's work and so on. That's that's a standard because I want I want I want to ensure that uh, we are supporting aspirant artists, designers, and entrepreneurs to take their place in society as ethical beings. You know, as people who who are going to have a social responsibility in that regard. You know, we'll we'll have standards about how we coexist 
together. We're all different. We've got different ages. We've got different lived experiences. We, we might have people. We, we might have people of pe- um, that have different faiths. We might have different sexual orientations. Um, um, different races all together. Um, some have abilities. Some have disabilities. You know, like it's it's such a melting pot that we have in in Australia, which I think adds to our richness and um and and makes us really exciting. But at the same time, you know, we've got to create some standards around. Uh, uh, codes of conduct and how we coexist and how we and how we how we respect one another and, and how we interact with one another and, and and how we regard one another and how we give people space to to voice themselves without judgment you know and fail forward all that type of stuff so there's standards wrapped around all of those things because they create habits and habits create culture but the challenge with standardization is I, I think all it does is perpetuate the tyranny of average you know, and 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 what what invariably can happen is that our 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 benchmark is is a minimum. And I don't know I don't know if I want to be continually part of a society that aspires for average. When when we when as humans we've constantly evolved because we've gone. How can we better than we were? How can we be better than we were yesterday? And you're right about a bit of that contradiction that we. The, as a system, we test them through standardised approach. But in a school, we understand the inherent value of the whole school experience and we want to give each person a best start in, in life and we want we give them these individual learning plans. The problem is at different points of that learning journey, they have to be measured against the same standard. Yeah. And if anything of modern science has told us, especially the neurodivergency, there's there's no normal student yeah i think i think um i think that's uh i, I think you're right i mean i wouldn't i wouldn't i wouldn't i would no longer use that word normal because i think it, it it could challenge and trigger some people but i i understand what exactly that's what i mean there's, yeah, there's, there's, no, there's no one there's no one there's no one student you know there's there's this there's this spectrum of of, of students that that come to us as there are the adults that care for them right <laughs> um and um and and we're all we're all on that in in some in some capacity uh you know again i'm fortunate to be in an environment where the very first thing that we do we have an orientation day like all universities would and 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 it's the same in secondary context as well right um we have an orientation day but our orientation day isn't just about the tin tax isn't just about here is our LMS. This is how you log on. Here, here is your email password. You know, email. This is how you create it. Um, all those things are important, and we do that. Right. But the very first session that the students have is a session that we call um, the pedagogy of encounter, and the session is fundamentally about our students and demonstrating to them when we use we use art and design to support this this thinking protocol, where we invite them into a uh, a deep discourse about themselves, about the place they're about to encounter, and the others that are in that room. And we do, we run through a series of exercises where each person then contributes their perspective over some artworks that we present to them. And invariably, as you would know, you could you could get students pick the same artwork, but because of their lived experience. And don't forget, I'm in a, I'm in a, an environment that I've got a broad range of of ages and lived experiences and um, orientations and all those type of things at a university level. Um, But then they all share their perspectives of these artworks in a way that really speaks about who they are. And one of the most important things about this pedagogy of encounter is it's divergent thinking, it's design thinking, it has the empathy piece to start with. And what we're trying to do at LCI Melbourne is model that diversity, equity, and inclusion aren't woke statements. I'm not interested in that. I'm not interested in in pe- people throwing that down my throat. What I'm interested in is what does that look like in a lived community? What does it look like in a place where people come together with divergent views? What does it look like where we can create a place, a safe place of harmony where everyone is welcome and able to share and then have a discourse that is free of any kind of judgment, free of any kind of ridicule, free of any kind of discrimination. Um, and then what we discover really fast is that these students 
all of a sudden, I've got students who come from regional parts of Victoria. You know, a regional kid's growing up experience is completely different to a city kid, right? I've got, in, I've got international students. I've got a students from Indonesia. I've got students from India. Their lived experience in growing up is completely different to an Australian kid, you know? Um, I've, I've got students who are neurotypical heterosexual. I've got students who, 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 who present as part of the LGB plus community. Uh, I've got students who it's a very small minority transitioning. It's not, you know, it's a thing. Um, I've got students who, who insist on particular pronouns and I've got others that go, oh, I'm a he, him, and that's who I am, right? Like it can actually all be, it can actually work, but it, it's got to be intentional about that learning community going, every voice is valid. Yes. And, and how do I keep ensuring we create, intentionally create spaces for that to occur? If we start with that piece of voice, which is basically about a deep sense of belonging and identity, then we can support them to move into the second piece, which is the mastery piece, which is the place piece, which is the agency piece. And then once they've navigated that with a degree of confidence, then we can move them to the, to the place of amplifying their um, advocacy, the whole idea of being stewards of community, leaders in community, contributors to community, not simply net takers. And I think that's our responsibility, right? Our responsibility is to help help people unlock their voice, feel comfortable in their own identity, develop their potential through mastery, through exchange, through working with mentors, to working with their peers, to working with specialists, um, and then eventually developing uh, uh, a, a conviction in the work that they produce that can make a difference in society. So we got that self piece, then we've got a place piece, and then ultimately we've got the other piece. I feel that's what our responsibility is in education, not only just to, to prepare them for the world at work, but to, to, to prepare them to be active and courageous contributing citizens that, that they will eventually be the leaders of and they will make contributions to shaping the next generation that follows them. Like that stewardship piece is an important piece. Oh, definitely, yeah. You are speaking my language. <laughs> There's so many things you need to talk about. Thank you, Joy. LTI? Yes. Yeah. Um, and I do in my classroom. Yeah, it's right. about getting the students to listen to each other, to have enough courage to express their opinion, but not to be shot down by anyone else. Yeah. Like one, one term I heard recently, and I love it, um, is let's be let's disagree without being disagreeable. And it's about having that respect. Yeah. Um, like you said, you've got a diverse range of age and cultures and and the whole melting pot. Yeah. But they all bring something valuable to the room. You know, like I'll give you an example. Um, I'm of a generation that only ever grew up understanding he and she, right? Uh, and 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 um, the the whole thing about people choosing pronouns uh, continues to challenge me. I, you know, because I was I I grew up understanding that language and grammar was structured a particular way, but I'm also not that. Um, arrogant to think that m my thinking should be the only thinking. And what I've, what I've intentionally done is try to um, enter into spaces that, that, that challenge my conventional way of looking at the world in some of those pockets, you know. Uh, and, and at the same time, I've challenged them. I'll give you an example. You know, I, I had a couple of students come to me. They're very young students, you know, 18, 19. Um, and express concern about how one of the mentors was misgendering them. And so I was listening to this whole conversation, um, them sharing this with me, um, and, and one presented a little bit more rational than the other. You know, one, the one that was really a, a outraged, I'm going to use that word intentionally, was about absolute, like this is, shouldn't be happening. And, I, and then I said, okay, so I listened for a good 20 minutes. And then I said, uh, I'm not going to use their names. Um, but I said, um, does your mentor know your preferred pronouns? 
And the answer was, well, I don't know. I said, okay, well, then how do you how how can they misgender you if if you don't know? And by the way, in this whole thing that I'm listening to them, there was a lot of ageist comments that were being made, right? Because um, they were suggesting that because of the age of the mentor, they're they're out of touch. And I did actually point out to them that ageism is discriminatory, right? Um, uh, very fast, but then. But then the person who was in that room as a support person who was a very rational thinker said, hold on, what are you saying to us, Adriana? I said, well, um, have, has, um, have you actually mentioned what your pronouns are? Have you gone up to the academic mentor at the end of the class and said, look, by the way, I, I want to be called they, them, whatever, right? Um, and they said, no, we've never done that. And I said, so... Instead of you just making an assumption because of their age that they're doing this intentionally, why don't you enter into a dialogue with them and share with them what your pronouns are and maybe highlight to them that when they get it wrong, how it makes you feel. Because I'm going to t- I said to them, I'm going to tell you something right now. I guarantee that that mentor hasn't woken up today and said, my intention is to misgender someone. My intention is to make someone feel uncomfortable. Anyway, they tried it. Now, I might have done some work in the background with that mentor, right, who was mortified because it was never their intention to to make anyone ah. feel whatever, right? Um, and we're and I said I said to these two to these young people, we're all learning in this space, but don't close your your mind to the possibility of that someone who's in their 50s as we shouldn't close our mind to the possibility of that you want to be referred to as they them. I don't understand it, but I don't have to close my mind to the possibility of it, right? And and so then they entered into a dialogue and I said and 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 I said, how's it going? And they said, well the whole di- the dynamic has changed. I go, what's changed? And they said, well we've entered into a conversation. I go, yeah, because you were quick to judge. And you were quick to hang someone, but you weren't quick to simply have a conversation with them. And so this this world that we often live in, it's this outrage culture that we just go from zero to 100, you know, and, and we just dismiss people without actually hearing their story, without actually being open to understanding their context. Because that academic mentor the most important thing that these students learned was that academic mentor's intention was never to make them feel uncomfortable, but they just weren't empowered with the information. Yeah. You know, and then, and then, and then it, it just softened so many things and uh, trust was formed a lot quicker then. But, you know, this is the thing, right? Let's just be open to having the dialogue. Yeah, let's um, be, uh, you know, slow slow to speak, quick to listen, because that's going to be, yeah, that's going to get a slow to end Yeah, ab- absolutely. And I, and I feel that we have a responsibility in, in our, all of our learning communities to create safe spaces where people can have the dialogue. Because you and It's you, important. You, it's so important. I, I don't want to live life through rose-coloured glasses because we know society is not like that, right? We know that there'll be people that they will encounter that won't give them that space. We know there will be workplaces that won't give them that space. But I feel that as as learning institutes, um, we have a responsibility to create spaces uh, where we ask the question, who, whose voice is missing and what does that impact our understanding of the world? You know, how do we keep Abs- doing that? Absolutely. Like it's, it, it's so important in today's society and it's one of the things that I think over the years has it's disappeared to a certain extent for whatever reason. Yeah. Uh, you know, some people will blame social media, some people will blame uh, certain things in society. Whatever the cause, I think we need to look at how do we change it back to having a robust dialogue, having conflicting points of view, yeah. having that, that discussion, and then walking away from it. Yeah, I think so. And I think sometimes, I think sometimes it's okay to sit in the tension for a little bit too, right? You know, like, yeah. I, I, um, but but it doesn't. It, it shouldn't then mean that I dismiss you outright. Look, I'll put a little asterisk there. I mean, if you're, 
you know, if you're saying something that's uh, blatantly a racist, or if you're saying something you know anti-Semitic, which is racist in, in, in its construct, if you're saying something that is inherently misogynistic or sexist, that shit should be called out, right? Definitely, right? That shit should be called out. That's the standards that you know we were talking about a bit earlier. Um, you know, we've, we've got to have those kind of guardrails uh, as as a society, as as a measure of what what makes a harmonious society. But sometimes we have to sit in the tension when there is disagreement uh, in discourse. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't be open to coming back and revisiting it, you know, and continuing the conversation. You, you and I Keep have those channels open. You and I have only met today, and I'm, we've got we've probably got completely different upbringings. We've got completely different contexts. I mean, you know, unfortunately, you were born in New South Wales. At least I'm in the best state in, in Australia and Victoria. Uh, <laughs> you know, um, and, um, and um, you know, th- there'll be things that are different, but uh, I genuinely believe as humans. We can actually find common ground, and and I feel that when we do that, and we're open to the possibility of each each other's story, um, it's amazing what we'll discover about ourselves as well as the other. Most definitely. Yeah, yeah. Hey, I I, I want to finish it there mm-hmm. um, because I want to be respectful of your time. You're tremendously busy man, and I like to say we. Fresh this event, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I just want to, I want to thank you for your time. Your yeah. insights have been amazing. It's so great chatting with fellow designer, design thinker, creative, risk taker. Um, and just want to see what looks for the good in everything. Yeah, well, thank um, you. I appreciate you saying that, mate. Um, I'll just leave this with your listeners. I challenge everyone listening to this in, in K-12 to education to make creativity uh, the, the same primacy as literacy and numeracy. I like that. <laughs> hey, what's the best way to get a hold of you if people want to contact you? Yeah, sure. Look, um, I'm pretty active on LinkedIn, so I reckon um, it's very easy to find Adriano De Prado on LinkedIn. Um, I'm still on X, you know, formerly Twitter, at Adriana De Prado. So I still post there. That seems to be a kind of um, um, a dying space, but I, I, I kind of do enjoy elements of it still. But they're probably the two best platforms. The other thing I'll say to everyone is um, uh, discover more about the magic of our, the LCI education, and they can go on LCI Melbourne. Dot, um, edu.au to discover what we do down here in terms of art design and entrepreneurship education. We're one of 23 kind of campuses around the globe across six continents. Um, uh, our Northern Hemisphere campuses have over a 65-year pedigree within this particular space. We're relatively new in Australia. Um, but if people want to discover more about how to do character Competency, competency and wellness learning. Hop onto that website and um, hit hit us up for a tour. Most definitely, I'll, I'll put I'll put the links in the show notes. But last and not least, I could it wouldn't be the tattoo teacher podcast <laughs> without asking you: Do you have any tattoos? Wow, this is the first podcast ever that I've been on that someone's asked me that question, and I said, "Yes, I do." Yeah, yeah, I've got. Um, I've got a uh, a Latin uh, quote called "Esta perpetua" on my foot, meaning "Let it be forever," and that's uh, after um, uh, uh, the woman that I wanted to marry unfortunately passed away in our in our early thirties. Um, so that's just my little tribute to uh, to Michelle, and um, I have a tattoo on my on my bicep um, that is the flower of life because I've got to be internally optimistic. Absolutely. Well, two things. One, I'm sorry to hear about that tragedy earlier in life, but at least you have, uh, I'm sure, fond memories and yeah, and a tattoo to remember her by. Yeah, yeah. No. And the flower of life, mate. Why not? Why not? <laughs> yeah. There you go. <laughs> well, Adriano, again, thank you so much for your time. Uh, you have a wonderful evening down in Melbourne, and uh, and. Hope to catch up with you again real soon. Yeah, thanks very much, Phil, and I really appreciate your time. And um, uh, if the listeners want to um, anyway hook up, I'm sure the, the, the notes will be, uh, the show notes will have that where, where you can contact me. But I really appreciate you uh, inviting me and um, keep doing the good work, mate.
Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you for listening to the Tattoo Teacher Podcast. I hope you enjoyed the conversation and found it insightful. If you like what you heard, please subscribe, leave a review and share with your network. Special thanks to DJ Fruit Salad for the music. You can find more of his work on Instagram at DJ Fruit Salad Official. Thanks again for listening and I hope to see you in the next episode. Stay cool, be blessed. Thank you for listening to the Tattooed Teacher Podcast. I hope you enjoyed the conversation and found it insightful. If you like what you heard, please subscribe, leave a review and share with your network. Special thanks to DJ Fruit Salad for the music. You can find more of his work on Instagram at DJ Fruit Salad Official. Thanks again for listening and I hope to see you in the next episode. Stay cool, be blessed.